meant to kill me, sent to destroy me, and I thought that it would, and I thought that it should, cause I messed up so many times, I went left when you said right, I'll understand if you wanna let me go, let me go, let me go, but you held on to me, and you wouldn't let me go, and you wouldn't let me go, go, go. And what the enemy meant for evil, God has worked it out for my good. Hey, what the enemy meant for evil, God has worked it out for my good. Galberth for my good. God bless you, beloved, and welcome back to the beloved kingdom, our online family. So if you're 
jumping back in tonight we welcome you back and if you are jumping in for the first time we welcome you for the first time we're grateful that you decided to spend some time in prayer and bible study with us tonight so today is wednesday january 13 2021 I'm Pastor Dana, Senior Pastor of After His Own Heart Ministries. I'm here with Executive Pastor Rico, my husband, Pastor Rico Watson, and you. And we thank God for each and every one of you tonight. Now, what I wanted to do is uh, start off real quick with two prayers. And these are two powerful prayers from Apostle Kimberly Daniel's book called Prayers That Bring Change. Now, I'll just give you a heads up. Pastor Kimberly Daniel goes deep in her prayers, and so she might list some things that you've never heard before, or never heard called out or heard stated before. But she is a woman of God, of the Word of God, and of great revelation. Um, so prayers that bring change, Pastor Kimberly Daniels, she's a pastor, I believe, in Orlando, Florida, and... Um, now she's apostle and Dr. Kimberly Daniels. So I wanted to pray these prayers before we get into uh, the continuation of our Bible study, Are You a Deliverer? And uh, if you uh, have a moment and you'd like to, we invite you to like and share our page and we appreciate you for every time that you have done that and that you do that. There's two prayers I want to pray tonight. Uh, she has a prayer in this book called Breaking the Spirit of Betrayal. Betrayal. And when I uh, looked at this prayer, it reminded me of what is going on in the United States right, right now. And uh, what we always recognize and try to keep in the forefront of our minds is that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So this is going to be a powerful prayer addressing uh, the spirits of betrayal. And uh, also the next one, territorial warfare prayer. Now, these prayers aren't necessarily short, but they are packed with power. So take a moment and just agree with me with the spirit of the Lord in this prayer. Uh, the scripture says where two or three of you, let's see, if any two of you, this is the one I want, if any two of you agree as touching anything they shall ask it shall be done for them by my father in heaven and so what we're doing tonight is uh we're going to ask god for forgiveness of our sins and shortcomings and then we're going to go to warfare together with this prayer tonight there's some plans that uh, the spirits of darkness has for this nation the united states and we welcome everyone from every nation around the world if you're jumping in on our live or anytime you jump in, God bless you. But God has planted us right now as a ministry uh, and, and many of our online followers in this nation, and this nation is in need of prayer and divine intervention. So we will go ahead and pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Almighty God, um, for declaring the end even before the beginning. And in that, we thank you that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, was slain before the foundation of the world because you knew we would need a Savior. And so we thank you for Jesus being our Redeemer and our Deliverer. And we ask you to forgive us of our sins and shortcomings, our sins of omission and commission, of transgression and neglect, our sins of presumption and hesitation cleanse us of secret faults and sins. And we thank you, Father, for the revelation you've given lately about forgiveness. And Father, we drop, release, and let go of any resentment against anyone so that we can be forgiven. So we forgive anyone who has offended or violated or betrayed or just let us down in any way. We forgive them because they didn't know what they were doing because we wrestle not against flesh and blood. We recognize, Father, that it was not the person. So we choose to humble ourselves. We choose to forgive. We choose to seek your face. And thank you, Father, that we choose to turn from every wicked way, not only unforgiveness, but 
any area that you show us needs to be repented of, we will repent because you are holy, God. And you said, holiness without no man shall see God. And so we repent. And in that, we thank you, Father, that you will hear from heaven and you will hear our land. So thank you, Lord, for delivering us from the enemies in our midst. The spirit of Judas is hung on a tree in the spirit. In the name of Jesus, we bind the bag of Judas, which carries death to relationships, nations, betrayal, envy, jealousy, strife, and greed. The dagger of the demon released to stab God's anointed in the back is broken. We send confusion to the spirit that gives aid or information to strong enemies against our purpose. We plead the blood of Jesus over this nation, over every treasonous relationship, over every violation of trust, over every false allegiance, over every part-time friendship or breach and covenant sent against, set against us. We break the power of all witchcraft to include octopus alliances against the mind, crab spirits that pull down and oppress, or caging incantations that cause confusion. We decree that our feet are anointed, just as Jesus' feet were before he faced his Judas attack. No weapon formed against us will prosper. Every evil confederacy and conspiracy meeting against us behind dark doors will fail. Every negative confession or evil decree made on our behalf and on the behalf of our nation will get stuck in the demonic gateways and never prevail. The spirit of schism cannot operate in our midst. Every spirit of division will be broken by the spirit of communion. As those whom God causes us to, to knit with walk in godly communion, all divisiveness will be identified and separated from our midst. The spirit of paradidomi, betrayal, will not deliver our associates and us to prison. Liberty and fellowship walk strongly in our camp. Liberty and fellowship walk strongly in our nation. All relationships in our midst are cleansed, purged, and made pure. Backstabbing, backbiting, gossip, lies, underhandedness, and undermining spirits are bound up and off of us in the name of Jesus. The heels of our associates and ourselves are anointed. We will not trip, stumble, or offend unto failure in our purpose. The spirit of unity is in our camp. The spirit of unity is in our nation. Agreement is the foundation of the vision. We declare agreement that will release prosperity and cause the blessings of the Lord to be loosed. One person will put a thousand demons to flight. Two people will put 10,000 demons to flight and a threefold cord is not easily broken. Those whom God causes to yoke with us will form a circuit in the spirit so that the flow of the Holy Ghost will be loosed in the earth. This flow will come against all negative attempts of the enemy to spoil our relationships and our assignments. The only betrayals that will, that will prosper against us will be for God's purpose. Just as Judas's purpose was to get Jesus to the cross, the purpose of our strong enemies will deliver us to our destinations in life. God, we thank you for connecting us with people who are like-minded, walk in harmony, and love Jesus. We thank you for the anointing of being jointly fit together so that the fivefold ministry purpose of God will take us into the perfecting of the saints' anointing. We will not be blown to and fro by every wind of doctrine or false teaching. We will speak the truth in love and not allow our differences with others to divide us. Instead, our differences shall bring us closer together. Together, Every arrow that the enemy sends against our relationships will be boomeranged back to the pits of hell. The demons called screw tape and warm wood will not mix our words and cause misunderstandings. The unity of the spirit is so strong that every joint of the vision is supplying its part. Increase is our portion and the arrows of the spirit of betrayal over our lives, our ministries, our families, our nation are broken and ineffective forever. In Jesus name, hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I hope you guys receive that prayer and pray that with me. Hallelujah. 
Thank you, Jesus. And now this, this last prayer I want to pray before we get into our Bible study tonight is a territorial warfare prayer. So you do understand that um, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Principalities are territorial kings, little k, in the demonic world. And so what we're seeing right now in the United States play out before our eyes started with a warfare in the spirit. See, we, not be, we may not be able to see with our natural eye the spirits of treason and sedition, but those spirits are, is what has been stirred up against the freedom of this nation. See, we don't take it for granted that we have the freedom to read our Bibles, to have a Bible, to meet and gather as the church. Many nations are not able to do that without persecution and do not have that freedom. So I'm sure that the enemy wants to, what I saw is he wants to tap down one domino that will cause all these other dominoes to fall. And he hopes to remove our freedom and our peace. Well, let me say it like Bishop Jake says it and others. Well, the devil is a liar. No, no, no. We take authority over every power of the enemy. Luke 10, 19, behold, I give unto you power and authority to trample upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means harm you. If there was ever a time to pray, the time is now. So I'm also going to pray this second prayer tonight and then we'll get into our study. It's a territorial warfare prayer. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we release a spermatic word into the spirit realm to affect the earth realm for the purpose of God. We die to the natural man. We cover our churches, its pastors, peoples, ministries, and facilities. All that we are, all that we have and possess, including our families, our marriages, our children, our jobs, our finances, our possessions, our health, our safety, and welfare with the blood of Jesus. We plead the blood. We bind Satan, the spirit of Beelzebub, the prince of the north, south, east, and west, the prince over every continent, the prince over the United States, the prince over the states that we reside in, Indiana and others, Missouri, whatever state you're, re you're residing in, state that state. We bind the prince over the cities that we are occupying. We bind the princes over the states of Georgia and in between. We bind the princes over the cities that we live in. You can state your city that you live in. We bind the prince over this county and all territorial spirits, all principalities, all exousia power spirits, the rulers of the darkness of this world, wicked spirits in high places, and all spirits not of the Holy Spirit. We bind the ruler spirit assigned over the individuals of our ministries and families. We bind all spirits above, on, and below the earth. All watcher spirits, scanner spirits, eavesdropper spirits, human spirits that travel by astral projection, divination and witchcraft spirits and spirits of superstition, all spirits of Jezebel, Python, Guile, and the Antichrist, the fault finder spirit, the death spirit, all spirits of slander, scandal, defamation, accusations, and false accusations, all spirits of persecution, <clears throat> prosecution, opposition, hindrance, interference, and obstruction, all blocking spirits, all spirits of confusion, division, lies, discord, and argument. The Ahab spirit and the spirits of Balaam, Korah, and Cain. We bind all litigation, discontent, and warring spirits, including the spirits of civil war is bound. We bind all familiar spirits assigned to us, to our families, and to our nation. We bind the spirits of seduction and the beguiling spirits of pride, presumption, arrogance, unbelief, obsession, ill will, distraction, assassination, character assassination, doubt, all fear spirits, and all nature spirits.
Okay, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And let me find if the Lord wants me to read this next one. We cut and sever all ties, bonds, cords, and soul ties with all with corporate or personal sin, repenting and renouncing all sin, all by trusting and expecting expectant faith in Christ Jesus' name. And we decree that all these prayers are accomplished for your glory, Father. Now that these spirits are bound, we break their supply lines and communication lines that bind up and off of us all reinforcement and retaliation by the enemy. We speak and decree upon them spiritual confusion, spiritual deafness, dumbness, blindness, paralysis, and incapacitation, all in Christ Jesus' name. We throw their plans into continual confusion and decree all of these things accomplished in Christ Jesus' name. We decree that they cannot obstruct, confuse, harm, deceive, or divide our nation or our people to frustrate the move of God in Jesus' name. We lose the perfect will of God with the untapped power of the Holy Spirit over everyone involved in this vision in our prayers, and we release them to walk in the anointing of the Holy Spirit to bring forth the perfect will and purpose of God. We come into agreement for the ministering angels, warring angels, and guardian angels of the Lord Jesus Christ to be dispatched immediately. We send you forth to cause these prayers to be according to the words we have spoken. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for salvation, deliverance, and healing throughout our communities, throughout our cities, and our nation. We thank God for the body of Christ working fitly joined together for the overall vision of God. Holy Spirit, Woo your people and cause them to tap into where you are taking your church for this season. We take authority over every territorial spirit throughout the United States and confess that this land was dedicated to and still belongs to Jesus. Amen, if you believe that. His people are free to pray, free to praise and worship as the spirit leads. Satan is bound. We also bind every spirit, mentioned or unmentioned, known and unknown, coming through any individual organization, adversary, or would-be adversary in Jesus' name. And we lose the spirit of unity and communion, love and forgiveness. You are forbidden to operate against the vision of God. And we command you to return to the point of your origination against us. We send you back and return every curse that came with you in Jesus' name. The angels of the Lord displace you, and you have been permanently evicted from this day forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, I know those two prayers were a mouthful, but they are prayers that bring change, okay? So let's return to our study of Joseph in our series, uh, Are You a Deliverer? This is a continuation of the Deliverer's Playbook. Tonight we're in Genesis 41, so hop on over to Genesis 41 with me. And as we do that, I want to revisit a couple of definitions. So what or whom is a Deliverer? Here's a good definition of a deliverer. It's one who releases or rescues. A preserver. One who releases from restraint. One who sets at liberty. And one who delivers another from captivity. That's what a deliverer is. That's who a deliverer is. Now, the definition of a playbook, because our title this is probably part three of the Deliverer's Playbook, is a playbook is a stock of usual tactics or methods. It contains all the pieces and parts that make up the go-to approach for getting things done. It includes processes and even how to flow, standard operating procedures and cultural values that shape a consistent response. Now, I gave both of those two definitions quickly. I know I did, but I did mention them in our last Bible study, which was a week ago tonight. And so uh, you can also go to our page and 
jot down those definitions if you haven't caught them yet. So what's going on in Genesis 41? Okay, so it begins with Joseph, he's still in prison. Yeah, not a fun place to be. But God is methodical. He, he is up to something. And so, uh, listen, there is so much in Genesis 41 that we won't even get through everything I want to pull out all the diamonds and all the jewels that I want to mine from this chapter. I actually can't do it in one setting. And so this is, uh, uh, we're going to dive into Genesis 41 and what the Lord has revealed so far from Joseph's playbook as a deliverer. We're going to learn some more things tonight, but uh, even tonight I'm going to get through all of them and we'll jump back in Genesis 41 next Wednesday, one week from one from tonight, Lord willing. So here we start in Joseph uh, chapter 41. Of course, Pharaoh, uh, it, those of you who read it, has had a dream. Now, uh, last Wednesday when we had Bible study, I asked you guys to teach it with me. And anything that you gleaned from the chapter, you're welcome to still type it in this week. And we'll uh, learn from each other, okay? Iron sharpens iron. And so I appreciate those of you who are reading for the first time or rereading the life of Joseph, studying it, meditating on it, spending time because there are some things that God wants to speak directly to you. But what it requires is a pursuit and patience. It requires sitting at God's feet and saying, okay, God, I read it. Now, now what are you saying? Uh, sometimes you, you uh, in uh, pull in a uh, include is the word I was looking for include uh, a study Bible like I've used the life application study Bible tonight on this chapter and it broadened my understanding of some things and so uh, that's what I'm encouraging you to do so what has happened uh, in the beginning of Genesis 41 is is it details Pharaoh's dream and so I want to go ahead and hop down. We actually had two dreams. We'll see that clearly. I want to hop down, though, and start in at verse 8. I'm reading from the New Living Translation tonight. And we're just going to read through because this is Bible study. And hey, let's get it in, okay? We love the Word of God, don't we? So it's always a good time to read His Word. Hey, if we can spend an hour watching the news about the impeachment and this and that, and who knows how long on Facebook. Well, we can put our face in God's book and read his word together. I know that you want to. Verse eight, it says, the next morning, Pharaoh was very disturbed by the dreams. So he called for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt. When Pharaoh told his dream, not one of them could tell him what they meant. Again, I'm reading out of the New Living Translation tonight. This is finally the king's chief cupbearer. We've heard of him before. Remember him? Spoke up. He said, today I have been reminded of my failure, he told Pharaoh. Some time ago, you were angry with the chief baker and me, and you imprisoned us in the palace of the captain of the guard. One night, the chief baker and I each had a dream, and each dream had its own meaning. There was a young Hebrew man with us in the prison who was a slave of the captain of the guard. We told him our dreams, and he told us what each of our dreams meant. I'm in verse 13. And everything happened just as he predicted. I was restored to my position as cupbearer, and the chief baker was executed impaled on a pole and impaled on a pole verse 14 pharaoh sent for joseph at once and he was quickly brought from the prison after he shaved and changed his clothes mm -hmm. after he shaved and changed his clothes he went in and stood before pharaoh then pharaoh said to jo joseph i had a dream last night and no one here can tell me what it means but i have heard that when you hear about a dream you can interpret it and look at verse 16 look at joseph's response he said it is beyond my power to do this joseph replied but god can tell you what it means and set you at ease so pharaoh told joseph his dream 
In my dream, he said, I was standing on the bank of the Nile River, and I saw seven fat, healthy cows come up out of the river and begin grazing in the March grass. But then I saw seven sick-looking cows, scrawny and thin, come up after them. I've never seen such sorry-looking animals in all the land of Egypt. These thin, scrawny cows ate the seven fat cows. But afterward, you would have you wouldn't have known it, for they were still as thin and scrawny as before. Then I woke up. In my dream, I also saw seven heads of grain, full and beautiful, growing on a single stalk. Then seven more heads of grain appeared, but these were blighted, shriveled, and withered by the east wind. And the shri sh sh shriveled heads swallowed the seven healthy heads. I told these dreams to the magicians but no one could tell me what they mean. Verse 25, Joseph responded. I love this. Both of Pharaoh's dreams mean the same thing. God is telling Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. The seven healthy cows and the seven healthy heads of grain both represent seven years of prosperity. The seven thin, scrawny cows that came up later and the seven thin heads of grain withered by the east wind, represent seven years of famine. This will happen just as I have described it, for God has revealed to Pharaoh in advance what he is about to do. I'm in verse 29. The next seven years will be a period of great prosperity, prosperity throughout the land of Egypt. But afterward, there will be seven years of famine, so great that all the prosperity will be forgotten in Egypt. Famine will destroy the land. This famine will be so severe that even the memory of the good years will be erased. My God. Verse 32. As for having two similar dreams, it means that these events have been decreed by God and he will soon make them happen. I love the way that the King James says that. It means that the fact that the king had the dream twice, Pharaoh had the dream twice, means that this thing is established by God and is soon to come to pass. And I thought that was interesting because what it reminded me of is Joseph had two dreams. Yeah. Joseph, remember in the beginning, he dreamed that um, his brother's sheaves bowed to his sheaves. That was the first dream. And then the next dream were uh, the, the, the sun, the moon, and the stars all bowed to him. And so uh, God is, he started out with giving Joseph two dreams. And now Joseph is interpreting two dreams and being reminded that if these two dreams are to say that this is established by God and soon to come to pass and Joseph is ministering to himself on the inside and the dreams that you gave me God are also established and soon to come to pass. All right, let's see. Therefore, um, verse 33, hope that's where I was. Yes, therefore Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh should appoint supervisors over the land and let them collect one-fifth of all the crops during the seven good years. Listen how detailed this is. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses. Store it away and guard it so there will be no food in the cities. So there will be food in the cities, excuse me. That way there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. Otherwise, this famine will destroy the land. So God gave Joseph a detailed plan. Look at verse 37. Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court. 
and all my people will take orders from you. Only I sitting on my throne will have a higher rank than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. I'm in verse 42. Then Pharaoh removed his signet ring from his hand and placed it on Joseph's finger. He dressed him in fine linen clothing and hung a gold chain around his neck. Then he had Joseph ride in a chariot reserved for his second in command. And where, wherever Joseph went, the command was shouted kneel down. So Pharaoh put Joseph in charge of all Egypt. And Pharaoh said to him, I am Pharaoh, but no one will lift a hand or foot in the entire land of Egypt without your approval. My God, look at that promotion. Verse 45, then Pharaoh gave Joseph a new Egyptian name, Zaphonath, Penea. He also gave him a wife whose name was Asenath. She was the daughter of Potiphera, the priest of On. So Joseph took charge of the entire land of Egypt. Verse 46, he was 30 years old when he began serving in the court of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And when Joseph left Pharaoh's presence, he inspected the entire land of Egypt. How old was Joseph by now? He was 30 years old. Does anybody remember how old Joseph was uh, when uh, he had the first two dreams? and was thrown into the pit. Well, he was 17 years old. So now 13 years later, Joseph has been in prison, not only in captivity and uh, as a slave, but one who has been imprisoned. Now he ran the prison because God was with him. However, he was in prison. Okay, so now look at this. This is verse 47, as predicted, for seven years, the land produced bumper crops. During those years, Joseph gathered all the crops grown in Egypt, stored the grain from the surrounding fields in the cities. He piled up huge amounts of grain like sand on the seashore. Finally, he stopped keeping records because there was too much to measure. Look at that overflow. During this time, before the first of the famine years, two sons were born to Joseph and his wife, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera the priest of On. Joseph named his older son Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my troubles and everyone in my father's family. Joseph named his second son Ephraim, for he said, God has made me fruitful in the land of my grief. In verse 53, at last the seven years of bumper crops throughout the land of Egypt came to an end. Then the seven years of famine began, just as Joseph had predicted. The famine also struck all the surrounding countries, but throughout Egypt, there was plenty of food. Eventually, however, the famine spread throughout the land of Egypt as well. And when the people cried out to Pharaoh for food, he told them, go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. So with severe famine everywhere, Joseph opened up the storehouses and distributed grain to the Egyptians for the famine was severe throughout the land of Egypt. And look at this, verse 57, and people from all around came to Egypt. One of the translations says people from all around the world, that it was a worldwide famine, came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe throughout the world. There it says it. Okay. Still with me? I hope no one fell asleep while we read that because it's such a good, 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 rich, rich account of this deliverer's life, Joseph. The first one that I wanted to point out comes from uh, what what happened when uh, the chief butler finally remembered Joseph. Okay? Yes. Thank you, Melana. Genesis 41, 8 through 57. Number one, this is something we can glean and learn from the Deliverer's Playbook and from Joseph's life. Here it goes. It is not uncommon for people to value what you can do for them more than they value you as a person. See, I want all the Deliverers to know this in advance. I, I want you to internalize, remember, and recognize it's just a mark of a deliverer. See, people may want your gift and they may want you to speak to them in a certain way or uh, prophesy to them or 
pray with them and for them. They, it's not uncommon for people to care much more about what you can do for them than they actually care for you. See, when the, when the chief butler finally remembered Joseph, it wasn't because he remembered um, how excellent a man Joseph was or even remember that Joseph asked him to put a word in for him to Pharaoh. But he remembered Joseph's gift, what he could do, uh, interpret dreams. And so number one, it is not for a deliverer. It is not uncommon for people to value what you can do for them more than they value you as a person. Why do I want us to know this? Because if we know this in advance and out the gate and are aware when it happens and, and, and when you notice that, you won't become offended. It's just part of it. It's part of the deliverer's playbook. It's just what happens. Number two, a deliverer recognizes the importance of how they present themselves. Why do I say that? Because verse 14 said, Joseph shaved and changed his clothes before going before Pharaoh. Yeah, see a deliverer knows that you do not come before a king just any kind of way. No, no. See a deliverer recognizes, this is it again, number two, a deliverer recognizes the importance of how they present themselves. Remember, the scripture tells us that people judge the outer part of a person, but God judges the heart. But a deliverer has the wisdom to know that even before people can get to your heart, they're going to be judging what they see. And so most people will. And so a deliverer, recognizes, a deliverer recognizes the importance of how they present themselves. Joseph could have been so eager, hasty, and happy to get out of that prison that uh, he didn't change his clothes or shave. But God wastes nothing. So for him to tell us that is for our education. God is teaching us in that. I love verse 16, um, where Joseph responds to Pharaoh saying, so I've been told that you can interpret my dream. And this is how Joseph's response is written in the King James. It says, it is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. And in the New Living Translation, this is how it says it. It is beyond my power to do this. Joseph replied, but God can tell you what it means and set you at ease. And so what was Joseph showing us here? Number three, a deliverer realizes that God is the source and that he or she is only a resource. I'll say it again. A deliverer realizes that God is the source, the capital S and that he or she is only a resource. Yes, thank you, uh, Maylana, for writing them in there. Yes, number three, as a deliverer, never forget this, guys, a deliverer realizes that God is the source and that he or she, we are only a resource. See, that's important because uh, God does not share his glory with another. So we've got to remember that uh, the anointings that we carry, the gifts, the callings, um, any good thing that people get from us, who's it come from? It comes from God. It comes from the source. Scripture tells us every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of lights is how it says it. Okay, I'm gonna reread verse 33 through 36 for this next one. And yes, thank you, Minister Maylana. You've got that in there just right. Let's look at verses 33 through 36 again. It says, therefore, Pharaoh should find an intelligent and wise man and put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh should appoint supervisors over the land 
and let them collect one fifth of all the crops during the seven good years. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses, store it away and guard it so there will be food in the cities. And number four, a deliverer knows that just as prayer is essential, certain plights require a detailed plan. Okay, I will say that again. A deliverer knows that just as prayer is essential, and Joseph was obviously a man of prayer because he was able to maintain his condition, his position in God. Joseph obviously knew that prayer was essential. So a deliverer knows that just as prayer is essential, certain plights, P-L-I-G-H-T-S, require a detailed plan. Joseph could have just said, well, we better pray about this, but he didn't. He had wisdom. And so he recognizes that uh, even though prayer is essential, a deliverer knows that just as prayer is essential, and it is, certain plights require a detailed plan. You will see that all through scripture. God gives a strategy. And so what we want to do with certain things that we face is say, God, give me the wisdom and the strategy that you have for this particular situation. A deliverer knows that just as prayer is essential, and it is, certain plights require a detailed plan. Okay. Hope you guys are getting it. Now, right after that, verses 37, uh, we see uh, that Joseph is made the ruler of Egypt. Uh, the movies that um, I used to show my children, one of them called the Prince of Egypt is what uh, Joseph is called. I love this, let's read it, 37 through 41. It says, Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the spirit of God? And Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. You will be in charge of my court and all my people will take orders from you. Only I sitting on my throne will have a rank higher than yours. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Here we go, number five. Uh, God will use a deliverer in the marketplace. Yes, God will use a deliverer in the marketplace. It does not always have to be in church. See, Pharaoh, he was not from a nation of uh, Hebrews. He, he was a Gentile nation. But here, God is using Joseph in the marketplace. So God will use a deliverer in the marketplace. And it does not always have to be in a church. Now, I've got several points from that area of scripture we just read. God will use a deliverer in the marketplace, and it does not always have to be in a church. You know, a lot of times we think someone who is blessed or endowed with wisdom or knowledge in certain areas. Well, uh, sometimes I've noticed over time, and my Aunt Rose told me about an account just like this, that she was pursuing a higher education, and uh, she was criticized for it at the time by people who were in church. But Sometimes the giftings, the calls, the anointings that God places on someone doesn't have to be just in a church or a pulpit um, or uh, come under lines of religious tradition. Some people God anoints for the marketplace, okay? Number six, a deliverer stays ready for their moments of elevation. Say elevation or promotion. A deliverer stays ready 
or their moments of elevation or promotion. Think about this. Joseph's seasons of preparation were the same seasons and occurred during his years of suffering as a slave and in prison. Yeah, that was Joseph's preparation time. Joseph's preparation time was during his years of suffering and during the years that he was actually confined to prison. So that's when I had encouraged us a few weeks ago, don't waste the suffering. Use what God has allowed to come into your life to push you to your knees, to thrust you into God's word, to begin to seek him as never before. See, God allows the suffering. It's a part of the process that we've been talking about. Um, but had Joseph wasted away or squandered those years of imprisonment, he wouldn't have been ready at a moment's notice to take this promotion in this place of authority that was given to him by Pharaoh. Okay, this is our last one for tonight. Number seven. A deliverer does not get to choose their location or many times their vocation. Remember, remember how God told um, Abraham to get away from his kindred and then go to a place that I will show you. Mm -hmm. And of course, Abraham uh, is such a deliverer that he is the father of all who belong to Christ. So number seven, a deliverer does not get to choose their location or many times their vocation. Now, why did I say many times their vocation? Some of you may already be in a vocation where God is using you greatly. So praise God. What you had in mind was what God had in mind. But that does not always happen. Joseph did not choose Egypt, nor had he trained to become the agricultural minister of Egypt. Yeah. A deliverer does not get to choose their location or many times their vocation. See, God is concerned with saving and preserving life of his people, of his creation. So he will use the life of a deliverer, the suffering and the anguish that they've gone through just to get them to the right place at the right time to deliver whomever God has sent them to. For this point that a deliverer does not get to choose their location or many times their vocation, I wanted to bring out verse 51 and 52. And it's where it tells us the names of Joseph's sons, his two sons. So he says, the scripture tells us that Manasseh was the first son and Manasseh's name means made to forgive. You're taking notes, write that down. Manasseh, Manasseh, it'd be better to say Manasseh because it's got an A there. Manasseh means made to forget. And what Joseph meant by that was that God had made up to him 
all the anguish of his youth and the loss of his father's home. I know the uh, translation that I read tonight, the, Lou, the New Living Translation said and caused him to forget his family. That's, that's not, just let me be clear, uh, it, it was not that Joseph forgot his family and like wanted to have nothing to do with them. But what God did is he made up to Joseph all the years of suffering and anguish. Remember the scripture tells us to not grow weary in well-doing for you will, that no, it says it like this, God is, yeah, do not grow weary in well-doing because you will reap if you faint not. God is faithful not to forget your labor of love. So uh, verses 51 and 52 tells us that uh, he had two sons. Manasseh was the first one. It means made to forget. Ephraim was the name of his second son, E-P-H-R-A-I-M. Ephraim's name means fruitful. And listen to this definition from the Living Bible. God has made me fruitful in this land of my slavery. My God, God has made me fruitful in the land of my slavery. God could have put Joseph anywhere on the face of the earth. But a deliverer does not get to choose their location. No, it was God's divine providence, his selection and election that chose Egypt for Joseph's assignment as a deliverer. So Joseph's second son's name, Ephraim, and Ephraim means fruitful. All right, guys, that was it. Now, listen, I do have the testing tonight. Let's see how good we've been able to listen and catch what we have read and heard tonight. And so that next one, Melana, is Ephraim means fruitful. E-P-H-R-A-I-M means fruitful. Okay, the testing. Here we go. Number one, our first question on our quiz tonight. How many dreams did Pharaoh have? Who can answer that? Type the number or the word in the comments when you get a moment. How many dreams did Pharaoh have? Pastor Rico just hollered it out. That's right, Pastor Rico. How many dreams did Pharaoh have? That's right, Mother Laster, two. Okay, here's our second one. Who did Joseph say interprets dreams? That's right, Melana got it. Mother Laverne got it. Shanice got it. That's right, and so did Joseph, that's right. Okay, here's our second one. Who did Joseph say interprets dreams? A, himself, B, Jesus, C, God. <laughs> Who did Joseph, or whom did Joseph say interprets dreams? A, himself, B, Jesus, C, God. That's right. Mother Lassiter, he said God interprets dreams. He, he knew better than to take the credit, right? Who did Joseph say interprets dreams? God. That's right. See, God. That's right, Melana and Shawnees and Mother Laverne. All right. You guys got that. True or false? This is number three. As a deliverer, God gave Joseph a choice of where to live. True or false? As a deliverer, God gave Joseph a choice of where to live. Is that true or is that false? That statement. As a deliverer, God gave Joseph a choice of where to live. True or false? 
false. That's right, Mother Lassiter. False. False. No, he didn't. Yeah, a deliverer does not get to choose their location. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Number four, what was the name of Joseph's son that meant made to forget? Was it A, Ephraim, B, Manasseh, or C, Asenath? What was the name of Joseph's son that meant made to forget? A, Ephraim, B, Manasseh, C, Asenath. Don't waste the suffering. You got that right, Sister Nikki. What was the name of Joseph's son that that meant made to forget? Yes, Shanice, you got it. B, Manasseh. Mother Laverne, Mother Laster, all you guys, Melana, yes. Manasseh means made to forget. Number five, how old was Joseph when he stood before Pharaoh? A, I forgot, I gave you some choices. A, 17 years old, B, 13 years old, or C, 30 years old. How old was Joseph when he stood before Pharaoh? A, 17 years old, B, 13 years old, or C, 30 years old? Yes, that's it. Shanice, it is 30 years old. That's how old the scripture tells her. Joseph. Yes, see? Yes, see, Mother Laster, Melana? You got it. How old was Joseph when he stood before, third, before Pharaoh? 30. You know, for God to include Joseph's age is, is um, on purpose. And it is also to speak to us uh, in some manner. Now, when I encourage you to study the scripture, this will be one of those points. Uh, yes, Mother Laverne, he was 30. He was a C. Um, so the reason why we study the scripture is the word of God is alive. It, it is a living masterpiece. And so when you study scripture, you see, it's a layer. God will reveal more things to you that he hadn't even revealed to me yet. Because... God wants to speak to you through his word. He wants to speak to you through Joseph's life. He wants, he wants you to be able to locate with him if you are a deliverer. Or there's some things that we're learning from the deliverer's playbook that God wants you to really grasp and understand for what he's called you to do. So God tells us that Joseph was 30 years old um, when he came before Pharaoh. Remember, quick, fast, in a hurry. He shaved and changed his clothes because he had to go right before Pharaoh. And he was 30. But remember when Joseph's plight, his, his ordeal of suffering began? He was 17. 17 years old. So... 13 years later, Joseph begins to see the breaking of dawn. In a moment, God flipped upside down his situation. And the last became first or second only to Pharaoh. So I hope you guys enjoyed that. Now, Actually, for next week, um, there's something you, you, you can stay right there in verse 41. Um, we're, we're just going to take our time in the series. Are you a deliverer? Take our time with Joseph's life. So you, next week, there's some more I, I want us to visit from chapter 41. Um, so let's continue to lift one another up in prayer. Um, our our nation. Listen, something that, that God showed me, this was when I studied Jacob's life and 
there's, there's a part right before you get to Joseph's life where his father Jacob had uh, wanted to breed a certain type of cow and he had a cow stare at uh, something that was spotted for a while and then the, 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 the cow's birth spotted calves. And so I just said that to say, uh, this is a time to not stare at and spend all day meditating on the news and the threats of violence that the enemy is spewing uh, because he, he wants to get us in fear. Uh, but instead, let's stare at and give more heed and time to God's promise to deliver and God's promises to keep us. And that if God be for us, who can be against us? Let's spend more time um, staring at God's word right now so that we can pray words of faith and watch God move in this situation. So I wanted to say that. Um, I want to remind you if you'd like to give, um, uh, Sister Maylana in a moment will put up how to do that. And, um, and we thank you for, praise God to everyone who has been giving um, so that we are getting our coffers ready so that as soon as it is safe, we will be able to occupy a building. And then also um, we are partnering with, um, thank you, Minister Maylana, we are partnering with A Life Today in combating human trafficking and the charity No Kid Hungry to uh, help answer um, food shortages for children in our area, in our communities. And so we thank God for the giving. And um, also the last thing I guess I wanna say, uh, make sure I have it, we will meet next Wednesday, which will be the 20th. And uh, so this Sunday is our Sunday where we're not meeting online, but our next time that we gather will be Wednesday, January 20th. Yes, and then I just wanted to remind everyone if you did not get to watch the video that is attached to our Sunday sermon um, about the young man who went to the judgment seat, um, please do that. Take some time and, and watch that. And because what I wanted to remind us all is to let's forgive and let go. Let's forgive, just like Jesus did, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Let's forgive and even let go of the resentment um, so that we can be forgiven because none of us want to miss God. And so I thank God that he's been gracious enough to give us these revelations in these last days because God is preparing for himself, as the scripture said he would, a church without spot, wrinkle, blemish, or any such thing. So let me pray a prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you. We've covered some ground tonight. Father, we thank you for giving us the Deliverer's Playbook, the Holy Scriptures. We thank you so much that we're able to go and learn by them and learn how you operate and how you want us to operate as your kingdom representatives on the earth. And so we are grateful to you, Holy Spirit, for opening our eyes and our understanding. Continue to work with us, Holy Spirit, and cause us to want to spend more time with God this year than we did last year. Cause us to want to go deeper in our relationship with God than we did before. And so, Father, we thank you for keeping us. We thank you for forgiving us of our sins and shortcomings and giving us the grace to let go and drop any unforgiveness and all resentment against anyone so that one day when we see you, we can hear you say, well done. We love you, Father. We love each and every one of you. We pray these prayers in Jesus' name. Thank you, guys. Have a blessed rest of your Wednesday night. Uh, remember, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. That's why we pray like we did before we began tonight. Thank you uh, for sharing in our Bible study and even the testing. Uh, that was fun. Uh, go with God and can't wait to see you next week.
Peace.